This is Jesse Hensley. This is Josh Turner. And this is Chris Bow. Welcome to Turn Down for What. Welcome back to Turn Down for What. Another another week, another epic episode. Uh, today we're going to kind of cover a couple unique topics. One, first and foremost, like we always do, <laughs> tell us what happened on Sunday. NFC champion San Francisco <laughs> 49ers making the huge comeback. Uh, thanks, Dan Campbell, for a couple of his risky plays. You know, you 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 get there by by taking risks and going for it, and sometimes it, it works the other way. I mean, they were over fifty percent on some of those fourth and going for it calls, and this time yeah. we stopped them both times. And they had a you know a drop pass that that hurt them, and then they had a turnover that hurt them, and then of course the um. You know, the immaculate deflection is what we're calling it, which is uh, right off the face mask of the of the defender and into Ayuk's hands. You know, that was uh, it's not something you normally see. So no, that's one uh, of the craziest plays I've ever seen. Yeah, it, uh, they always say rather be lucky than good. Right. And it's uh, in this case, uh, we got off to a rough start, got definitely got some luck and some breaks going our way and some choices. And I mean, I, I know on the first call that he made, the the stats show that that their kicker uh career is 50 50 from that from that distance and had not made a kick from that distance since 2020 so with that kind of as the background you know if your your kicker lifetime is 50 50 and he hasn't made that kick for you know a few years me and you've been going for it all year i mean he wouldn't be in this position if they hadn't been going for it so he was he was true to true to the team and true to his style of coaching and in this case it, it opened that door and the the 49ers walked right through it and they weren't gonna they weren't gonna weren't gonna go backwards from there you know so good yeah, good for I them mean, yeah down by 17 i was just like this this how can this go any crazier i mean the ravens lost which if you want my personal opinion the referees were a little bit biased for that Hilted. game there was there were several instances where i was like wow this is insane and i think in my opinion it was the nfl's plot to take down the <laughs> logo conspiracy because the ravens were better and it, it they definitely were the better uh, team it put and, an end to the logo conspiracy that's for sure but if the Myth refs busted. weren't playing if the refs weren't playing for the chiefs i bet you anything that it would be the ravens 49er super bowl but you know here i am well, I was There's happy there was no uh, no controversial calls. I mean, for the most part, it was a clean game. They 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 let they let them play the game, and that's what oh, I like to see. Because after 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 the Ravens lost, then it was just like, oh, now we can let the rest of the script play out like it's supposed to. So whatever. <laughs> oh, you're like you're like uh, that that old AM channel guy Art Bell with the conspiracy theories. You know, get you. <laughs> get, yeah, they they wanted all... they wanted Taylor Swift to be the Super Bowl hype girl, so they they had Naturally. to let the Chiefs go through. So. Had to get that, yeah, right. Good, yeah. good sponsorship, good advertising money, yeah, yeah. Now, now, like all the dilemma today is how is she going to get back from Tokyo in time for the game? Uh, and I'm like, I don't care. Pe- people, <laughs> people want to know these things, man. That's that's it's all about money. It's all they about say. Clicks, they say you know? if she if she takes her little jet and take flies straight back afterwards, that they will have she'll have like she'll be there Saturday night. So it's like it's more than fine. She'll be fine. Maybe the government can give her a nice military jet. Oh, I'm mid, sure. I'm sure. It, air it, refueling. I mean, America's America's heroes needs to right. be escorted home. So <laughs> this is great stuff, man. Oh Lord. Anyways, let's talk about EVs. Let's talk about EVs. <laughs> so we both did a couple things this week that I figured we could talk about today. Uh, one, you got a very unique opportunity to drive down and uh, do a little bit of a special, uh, let's say, delivery event for a, a friend. Tell us about it. Yeah, uh, Will F. The Pump and, and his wife uh, that does the SoCal EVs group down there, uh, Marty, two of them uh, finally got their Cybertruck scheduled for delivery. So I was like, man, that's great. Let me do a road trip. And that uh, was the first time I've I've done a drive that long from the Bay Area to Southern California. Um, round trip, it was about 750 miles uh, there and back. So that was a good experiment for me having, having the standard range lightning. But more than anything, I just wanted to be down there and kind of support him and there was about 10 of us there uh Talik was down there as well um and and captured it and did some great video and, and shots and then they went and did some uh like a, a shot with him next to a uh, a pumping station that pumps oil down in southern california and i saw that shot, down yeah. yeah it was great it was great stuff man 
and and Talik is such a whiz with the camera. There's shots where you swear that he's using a gimbal, and what's crazy to watch is he doesn't. He doesn't use a gimbal at all. It's just him, his uh, his the way he holds it and the way how he can smoothly walk at a level uh, plane. It, it was pretty cool to watch him work and kind of get the shots that he got. But it, it was great. We got down there to the to the Tesla dealer down near Long Beach, and um, they had the Cybertruck all covered. And there was about 10 of us there and I felt bad for the, the Tesla folks because um, there's a great time lapse of us kind of doing the once over on the truck front to back underneath opening every door looking for every little thing that, um, you know, may not be perfect so that we can get it on a list for 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 Will and Marty and get them to make sure they get it all fixed. And um, for the most part, though, it was just exciting. It had some great energy. Uh, I tell people it was uh it was more like the birth of a child than than anything else. I mean, it, it was a lot of positive energy, a lot of excitement, a lot of love for for Will and Marty, and people just getting to finally got to ride in it and experience it. And it's just a it's just a, an inspiring vehicle. I think it's it stands out. I, I know it's controversial for a number of different reasons, but everywhere we went, people were looking. Um, and we went to lunch afterwards and to Black Bear Diner that's there and got together. And there's a McDonald's drive through right next to it. And all of a sudden you see these two kids. They're in the drive through It's, you know, around lunchtime. So it's like seven, eight cars deep. These two kids jump out of the back of a, um, I, I, I think it was uh, the GM. What's the GM one they have? Um, why am I drawing a blank on that? The Hummer um, No, no, no. Nothing nearly that cool. They're, they're standard. Um, Draw a blank on the dang EV that the GM has, the one that sold most of them, the cheap one. Um, anyway, doesn't matter. Um, I they jump out of this, too, but... right? Right, yeah. The, the bolt, bolt? Are you the talking bolts. about the bolt, yeah, yeah, yeah. The bolt EV or EUV, you don't know which one, but they come jumping out of it, come over, kind of sheepishly looking, checking it out, and uh, we're like, oh, come on, get take a look, get inside. And Will opens it up and lets them see every bit of it. They were so excited. They got their cameras. We're doing pictures. Let them let them experience it. And you could just see the childlike enthusiasm and joy. And um, you know, they, these are the future of cars. You know, and and they see it, and then they run back and get in uh, back into the car again with their parents. They grab their lunch at McDonald's. They come circling back around. They jump out a second time. Their parents check it out. More pictures, and it's just that kind of energy. There's just nothing like it. You know, nobody's gonna take delivery of. Um, a pole star and get that same attention and i think that was kind of the real cool takeaway was just i think this is going to inspire people not just the oems and, and folks like that but it's going to open people's eyes they're going to ask questions they're going to learn about evs and to, to be around it and see it was was definitely special and uh a whole heck of a lot of fun man so i i loved it yeah well i mean that's just super exciting because i mean you're the, one of the really the first few people that's gotten to be up in and close to the cyber truck i've not seen one yet i mean you have yeah. the luxury of having one nearby your vicinity that you can go take pictures of but the closest one to me is three hours away uh, in charlotte and uh yesterday we had a, a little uh business trip to nashville so i'll talk about that in a minute but while we were driving we saw a tesla building and i was like there's not a huh. dealership in nashville but there's Tesla written on the side of this building. So we drove up to it to see like, what if they have one here, but it was a collision center. So like oh. it was a Tesla branded collision center. It's like they had branded parking spots. So like you'd, I guess, drop your damaged vehicle off. They would take it in, do the repair, and then you'd come pick it back up from your spot. Didn't do us any good. Uh, they, no they, cyber I mean, trucks you there. Could, you couldn't go inside and it was just a bunch of beat up, you know, model wise uh, that had gotten in wrecks, I guess, around Nashville. So that wasn't uh, what we were hoping for. But, you know, that's still, uh, you know, I've not gotten to see a cyber truck, but you've gotten to ride in one. Uh, yep. drive, drive one or just ride one. Didn't I? Didn't I? Didn't even want to <laughs> try. You know, try to like that's a, it's a special day. It was about him getting to drive it. I was happy to get inside. I I got but to sit torque. in it. Tried all the what was that? Yeah, I mean the torque experience is about the same. The for the all wheel drive is the lightning. Correct. I mean it, that's apples to apples for the all wheel compared to our trucks, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a little um a little little bit quicker, but not anything that any normal human would notice. I mean, it's pretty much the same same kind of thing. It, it was, I think, the big 
dynamic part of it is definitely that four wheel steer and the drive by wire. You notice yeah, that. Yeah, I'm right sure away. the four wheel steer was a cool thing to experience. Yeah, it was uh it, it was pretty cool because I know for me, whenever I try to park it or um just when I'm trying to do a U turn, I mean this thing is just uh whips around and it gets exactly where you want it to be. Um you know, you, you see where you want to be, and then you are where you want to be. It is, is you, you hit the gas and gas. That's funny. You hit the accelerator, <laughs> right? And just a little little nudge of the of the turn, and you are right there. And it is yeah. very agile. Um, you know, Will compared it very much to just driving any Tesla. It's going to feel very familiar to a Tesla driver, and which I is think to be that, expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely know you're in a Tesla. Um, I I think that the the quickness is great. The agility is great. The technology is great. It the panoramic roof uh, was just beautiful. You know, I mean, it comes right right there. Um, no, I, I know for for someone as tall as Will, I think is uh, I want to say he's like six three, six four. Um, his head is right there. Like if he tries to wear a hat or something, his head is going to touch that glass. If you hit a bump, that's probably not great. Um, so me you know, being six six, that's going to be an issue. <laughs> you would, yeah, you could not be in the back. I mean, you would not want to be in the back of the cyber truck for sure. Um, you're definitely kind of more of a six two or or lower, I would say. Um, there's definitely less room in the back of the cyber truck for sure. It is not as deep. Um, it's just leg room and that kind of stuff like that. Uh, and then the seats for me, being a big guy that I am, uh, the seats were a bit more narrow, more sporty for a normal person. It's going to be fantastic. Um, for for me, much like the Rivian, the Rivian's got got smaller seats too. Um, but kind of it's got that slight curve to it, and so it kind of the way it sits on my back, it, you know, I'm just too wide, I'm too too fluffy for that. So um, it, for me, it just reaffirmed that the Lightning was the right truck for me. Um, but I was absolutely ecstatic with with the Cybertruck, and I really do think that it's almost like a technology demonstrator in in some ways, right? It's a way to get kind of some R and D money into this amazing beast of a vehicle that they can then use, you know, whether it's the, the ethernet wiring or the 48 volts or the steer by wire or the four wheel, you know, four wheel steer, um, the servos that I think are very similar to what they're using for Optimus, the robot, you know, if you're going to put all that R and D stuff into something, you want it to be in this hundred thousand dollars spec. It's futuristic spaceship of a truck, you know I yeah. mean? So I think in some ways it sets them up to to spread out that R and D money that's going to prepare them for the less expensive Tesla to come that'll be built built out of Mexico. They'll prove it out, they'll vet it out, they'll streamline things, they'll learn from it, and they're going to deliver a truck that is just a heck of a lot of fun to drive, and it's smooth and powerful. And it, you know, I grew up in the '80s watching Battle Battlestar Galactica and Star Wars and <laughs> Star Trek, and it. It feels, it definitely feels like the future, you know, and it definitely feels like you're, you're in something that is dramatic. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I loved every minute of being in it. It's, it's all, it's all this typical stuff. The lightning to me, uh, is smoother. It's quieter. It's more roomy. Um, the weird, weird things for me, right? Cause at the end of the day, I'm a very practical person. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, there's flashy uh, and there's practicality and usually those things don't coincide. And yeah. uh, I mean, some of these sports cars are flashy and super cool, but they're just not the most comfortable things in the world. And that is what it is. But that's just part of, you know, that experience. And for me, I'd much rather prefer comfort over uh, flashy just because yeah. I spend hundreds of hours a year in a vehicle and why be uncomfortable to look cool. Uh, but the Tesla is still a very unique vehicle. Uh, if I you think want, if you want more on Chris's thoughts. He had a five minute uh, monologue on, um, on Twitter. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, not Twitter X, my bad. X Twitter. Um, X Twitter. Yeah. X Twitter. <laughs> X Twitter. Uh, right. Go to at Bo family and uh, you can go find his monologue. 13,000 people have uh, viewed and felt very yeah. passionately about this uh, monologue that you had about the practicality of the lightning for you and your yeah, life. It it definitely, um, you know, some people just can't fathom, like, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're putting a F-150 next to a cyber truck. What kind of idiot gets in the F-150? Uh, I guess I'm that idiot, you know, like I just, um, uh, stupid little things like for me, um, being able to have a grab handle, having the running boards, I'm sure there's gonna be aftermarket stuff for the running boards at some point. Rivian eventually had some, I believe, um, but dumb things, and this is something that it was the first time I ever recognized this was actually in the Polestar 2 uh, when I rented one from Hertz, and the Cybertruck has something similar. I like that my um, 
my arms, when they're just in their natural, relaxed, I'm on a road trip, you know, position. The window controls are right where my fingers are. So I'm I'm literally just move my fingers up and down the window. It's small, it's subtle, it's stupid, it's meaningless. But Cybertruck has it underneath your arm a little bit. And uh, like just the idea of I got to move my arm and where, where are those buttons? It's just not in a natural position, in, in my opinion. And yeah. the center console is not as wide as it is. So like if me and my wife are there and we both have our arm on the center console armrest, um, the the lightning has the wider one for yeah. that and it's perfectly that's one thing i with... appreciate my, my wife has a minivan uh the yeah. odyssey i mean and it doesn't even have a center console it's like the armrest that hangs down yes but like i love being able to lean over against my console yep. um red lights or whatever i'm doing um in the video you took you're leaning against the console of your lightning so i mean it's just it's a practical thing uh especially for comfort um yeah. and the ability to have the other side with that lo- longer larger ledge like you're saying with just the practicality of buttons and everything and, and and that's where everybody's different right because you know where that started for me is i used to have a, a 35th anniversary camaro with the ls1 engine and it um and bef- way before that i had this mitsubishi starion which was like the dodge conquest but the mitsubishi version and they're both uh, manual transmissions and so i got really used to have my my arm on the center console my hand on the shifter and just kind of that relaxed position so after years of driving that way even today i really i like that the, that shifter handle for example is right there my hand rests on it it's just yeah. years of muscle memory of comfort of driving it just again it just fits but you right can't, for me you can't jiggle it in in, in neutral like you could no. the old, old, old no, school no. trucks <laughs> yeah 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 that was the best you coast be uh be jiggling the uh the the uh, gear shaft so yeah or, or the old school like three on a tree you know what i mean like up yeah. on the yeah yeah i mean there's um those things are I just know. fun i drove a manual was my first vehicle and I, that was really at the end of the manual popularity. I mean, now pretty much every yeah. vehicle is standard automatic. Uh, there's yeah. some vehicles you can get still, but it's like a good old classic man. You got to respect it for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think that everybody's going to have a different use case and some people, I mean, sure. we've said this before, you're going to look cool driving the cyber truck around, especially Absolutely. for now. It, it's the only vehicle like it. The, the lightning is nothing super flashy. I still get the looks and people talking to me about it because they know it's the electric by the light bar and all that stuff. Yeah. But the, the cyber truck is just a unique added to the market. You're right. It cannot compare to the lightning. Technically it's its own species of vehicle. However, for yeah. me as a driver, would I give up my truck for it as a, the size I am and stuff? No, but would it be an epic vehicle for somebody? Absolutely. I mean, it's a cool yep. use case. Uh, we will have uh, your buddy on the uh, podcast probably next week or the week after that, just to kind of discuss his experience with the first couple of weeks of driving it and his, you know, he's, I mean, obviously he's a Tesla guy, but I mean, having the, he, he has the lightning, he has the, he has them both. So um, that's the great thing too, about getting to hear from him in a couple of weeks after he's had some driving under his belt with both, because he's got, he's going to be the best person to compare the two for sure. Oh, because yeah. he's also a, he's and also be a the tall first guy. Cyber truck driver that we can actually have that uh, can come on yeah. and actually talk about it. So that'll be, that'll be a fun thing to do. Um, he's got an impressive kind of- garage. He's got, he's got a Porsche. He's got a, a Tesla performance. He's got the F-150 lightning and now he's got the cyber truck. He, he and his wife have definitely, um, they they know about EVs and and they can definitely compare and contrast a lot better than I can you know with my very limited time in there. Um, but that that'll you know, be I, a very viable actual comparison of for sure the uh, two since he's driven both. Uh, not many a lot of people can speculate around what they feel, yes. but not very many people can sit there and actually say like I've driven it and this is my thoughts between the two, or just in general about the Cybertruck as far as the oddities or the cool things that he's experienced and. Um, I saw a video. Who was it? Somebody took a cyber truck. It was it Kyle. I don't know. Somebody took a cyber truck from like San Diego to like um, Las Vegas. Do you know who that was? Oh no, I missed that one. Yeah, I missed it. It was a, it was a it was a it was a YouTube video that I watched, and uh, somebody had taken it, and the amount of people that stopped yes. them, or or just like. They took clips of every time somebody drove by with their phone out 
And it yeah. was just, it, it, there was like dozens of them just on that road trip, trek alone of people like, yeah, you, yeah. you go, you do it, you do it. I was like, yeah, I mean, it's just, you're going to get all the looks and all the glances, but you know, it's a, a very cool vehicle. And then it'll be interesting to see how that actually equates to the use case of the future of that, um, the future of that. So that, that'd be something that obviously uh, it'd be cool to see his opinion driving between the lightning and that. Yeah. And then kind of comparing it up and, and seeing how the practicality of that actually goes. So that that's one that we'll definitely put into uh, motion for the next couple of weeks. Cause that'd be a, a fun conversation to have. So, yeah, I think at the end of the day, if, if it would have been available in uh, 2021, 2022, and I pulled the trigger and bought it, I'd have been super happy. I've been absolutely super happy. It would have been a whole lot of uh, excitement around it and new, and I wouldn't have known the difference. Um, but having been in the Lightning for what I paid and for what I'm getting out of it and what it does, um, there are a number of things that are certainly better about the Cybertruck, but it's not enough better where I'm going to trade in my vehicle, get a new get a new loan at the current interest rates, pay the kind of money that that thing is going to cost today. Uh, you know, when the price comes back down again, by that time, there's going to be a lot more competition. And it's, uh, I just, I don't see it for, for what I experienced. Certainly there's not enough Delta there. It's better. It's not enough better um, to even justify the, the sales tax again in California, you know, much, yeah, yeah, much yeah. less the price and the interest and all that kind of stuff. But if you're buying it for the first time and you're coming your first time in a truck, it's great if it's the first time in a truck ever. If you've never driven a truck before and this is your first time experiencing it, it's going to be better than anything you could have bought. And if you're coming out of a truck and you're not someone who's doing this, you know, all the stuff we always talk about, long distance, regular towing, you're going to love the ride. You're going to love the, the sound system. You're going to love um, how quiet it is. You're going to love the big glass roof. Um, the bed is is certainly great. It, it already has that, that sub frunk and it's already got the coating on there. Um, it's got the tonneau cover. It, it it's funny the little rear view mirror, especially when Will when Will reaches up with his giant paw hands to adjust yeah. <laughs> that rear view mirror. It looks like a rear view mirror that belongs in a roadster. Um, it, it's it's really strange to see it there. Um, but when you go on the the main screen of the Tesla, it's going to show you your camera rear view mirror, and that's what most people are going to use. Yeah. Um, that adorable little mirror up there is just almost for show. Um. But the the Tano was impressive. The the tailgate, even though it's not powered like ours, it it slowly comes down. It's super light, um, and it kind of slow closes back up again. It's got this cool rail system um, and lighting along the side of the beds that make it really easy for tie downs and stuff. It does have that weird shape, and and um, it was cool to I've seen people can put like bikes in the back, and the front tire can almost get into that little crevice because the the bottom of the bed is six and a half. If you were to measure the very bottom, it's six and a half feet long. But the as you go up higher, it's got a slant. Um, it's got a slant to the back of the bed for where that tonneau rolls over. And that slant means that the top of the bed is is only um, about five and a half feet, just like the lightning is. And yeah. I was always thought that was weird, you know. So like I always talk about if you were to try to put like a, a dresser or refrigerator up against it. There's a weird air gap there that potentially could make it tilt. But I've, I've seen like you put uh, bike tires and stuff. It kind of wedges in there kind of better. So again, use case, right? It, it just depends on how, how you're going to use that bed. It's not dramatically larger than the lightning though, even though it's a six foot bed or whatever it is in usable space. If I'm stacking boxes, if I'm moving a house, if I'm uh, moving furniture, I mean, there's, it's practically the same dimensionally. Um, it's it's four feet wide. The lightning is four feet wide between the wheel wells. So you've got some extra space there on the side yeah. that the, the cyber truck doesn't have. Um, so again, I mean, for most people though, you're talking you're talking on the margins there. Who's using that space? It's it's fine. It's gonna be great. Um I, and and I'm being able to lift and, and lower itself was really cool. So, um, you know, when it drops down so that you can jump in it, you don't really need the running boards. I just personally prefer them, but you don't need them. Um, and then when it lifts up again, it's quite impressive. It moves up quickly. Air suspension is is mm -hmm. nice. It's um, but yeah, it's it was definitely interesting. There was um, the arrow covers for some reason were on back order, so he's got to get those. 
Um, there were a couple little fit and finish issues. He's going to go back and get kind of polished out. So maybe we can get an update from him on how that went. He did a big event with the Tesla group down there where there was like seven cyber trucks all together in Southern California. And it made for some epic shots on the freeway. And they did a drive through the, the, the forest up there down a, a great road. There's some great shots. I think it was the Angeles national forest. I might be wrong on that, but, um, and then, and then the very, I think the very next day, he went and did an event with his Lightning on Sunday. Um, so yeah, it's going to be fun to hear from him, being living with it day to day, and kind of getting his input on what that's like, you know. Um, and then there was the retru- return trip home coming up back to Northern California, where it was just the typical Electrify America experience, you know, everything that is sad and unfortunate about the EV experience. It was funny because I just got a call. Um, from my district manager earlier today where he was um, he was renting a car and he had a chance to get a pole star. And he's just like, I'm just not going to do it. Uh, he, he's had so many problems with trying to find charging. And he's like, nah, I'm just, you know, he went back and got an ice. And this is, today. and this is, this is in California. Uh, I think he's up in Seattle today, but still okay. certainly on the West coast where, you know, yeah, I mean, like if you if you're concerned about charging infrastructure there, I imagine the rest of the United States, <laughs> right? California right. So, and Washington's about the best it gets nationally right now. And it's you know I I so I was uh, kind of testing how my standard range was going to do getting from Southern California back here. Takes me two stops, and there's a couple different options for which stops I wanted to take. But um, I, I was kind of scouting out for a future drive if I was going to do a drive with the adapters with the Tesla adapters. Uh, when they'll eventually come out here and there's a Harris ranch is kind of the premier um, stop for, for Tesla. There's a huge recharge station there. So I wanted to see if I could get from my house to Harris ranch, which was, wasn't a problem. And from Harris ranch back to my house is not a problem. And then the question is from Harris ranch, there's a a big kind of mountain range about 4,500 feet, close to 5,000 feet high called the grapevine. That's kind of separates Bakersfield from the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles and um, getting up and over that is, is certainly a challenge. I think I got one mile per kilowatt when, when I was going up and over it, but and like three on the way down, four on the way down. <laughs> surprisingly not. Yeah. Surprisingly really? for whatever reason, not. And um, you know, I'm curious if people have any, any thoughts on the best way to get the most out of the region, but for whatever reason, the, the incline up certainly, certainly worked against the efficiency and the coming down, it didn't. I mean, it was better. It got it. It got it from one, uh, one mile per kilowatt up to like two point two. But two point two is just my standard flat road. Of course, it had to make up for the miles where yeah. I was inefficient I, as well. I, think I, I usually see the average ends up offsetting. I mean, if you go yeah. up the hill, you're at one. But on the way down, if you reset it from the top down, it's going to be like fifty. But the average of the two will end up being that. Um, and I've I've seen that pretty average because I mean. The, loss and gain uh you're going to lose um energy when it comes to you know basically regenerating back into the battery but having the regen on helps you get back up to those those normal numbers for highway speeds which for me um kind of tangenting i'll let you finish your story but yeah, yeah. I, here it was i left my house yesterday morning like five o'clock in the morning and it was uh 35 32 35 degrees outside yeah. and our year model truck doesn't have the heat pump. The 25s will have the heat pump. You this year, and... I think. I think this year we'll have the heat pump once yeah, they finally yeah, yeah. start. Yeah. Yeah. I could have used the heat pump. I So I, yeah. I, I've taken the road trip a bunch of times and it's been warm outside. This was the first time that it was really cold, which is not super cold like compared to the northern states, but it was cold enough to where my efficiency I've always seen on the highway for these this this road trip I've taken several dozen times has been 2.1 on average, 2 to 2.1, depending on how fast I'm driving. And that's usually in the ballpark of um, at 75-ish miles an hour. I was getting 1.6-ish the oh, whole wow. trip yesterday. Um, and it was just because it was cold. It's the only thing that I could do. So I didn't even have the heat on high. I mean, I put the heated seat. It's on like one. But like it was all driving consumption based on the battery temperature. And yep. even with charging, but for that type of road trip, it made a huge difference with stopping twice versus usually what we would do once. But when we left to come back, 
I had like 30% battery, but I did not have enough. It was like 38%, but I didn't have enough to get all the way to the charging station that would be, uh, that I would usually come to on the way back. So I had to stop in Nashville. Then I had enough to get to Cookville, but I couldn't get to Knoxville. So I had to stop in Cookville, but then I couldn't get all the way home from Cookville. So I had to stop three times on what was the equivalent of a 200 and, uh, it's probably a 300 ish mile total trip. Um, And that's just where like, you know, it's, you'd think, you know, with the 320 range, you could stop one time and and get there, but it was three stops specifically with that charging, that, that state of charge two times on the way there and three times on the way back, which was crazy. Um, But, you know, at the end of the day, I've always had relatively negative experiences with Electrify America. I mean, that's been the typical feedback. I wanted to try out the new pilot um, systems. The that's flying EVgo, J systems. Right? Yeah. EVgo. And so it's an yeah. EVgo system and it's a Delta electronics charger. Whoever cares. I think some of their new ones might be SK Signet, but this one specifically was Delta. Um, and, you know, we showed up. It's covered charging, lit, nice, nice pull through parking spaces. That's great. Terrific. Cost 59 cents a kilowatt. Yeah. Which nowhere near has been anywhere near that expensive. And it literally cost us for the first stop cost us $38 to get like 50 kilowatts delivered. I was just topping off to get to the next stop because I chose to unplug because of how expensive it was. Um, The rest of the day we stopped at electrify America for the other three stops and electrify America has usually been by kilowatt and it's usually been afford like more affordable, like 35 yeah. cents a kilowatt. And sometimes it's by minute, but it's been like 40 cents a minute. So, I mean, it ends up that you're spending 12 to $15 to fill up the truck for some reason. I don't know. I think it's electrify America trying to like overcompensate for, I don't know what and I, we, I had this discussion on uh, X yesterday uh, with a couple different people, but it's a grant subsidy that they have in place. I'm not, I'm a charging station provider myself, and I'm not sure how they could economically make that sense. But the remaining three charges, which were each more power delivered than that first pilot stop, all yeah. three combined equaled like $16 uh, for an extra 170, 180 kilowatts delivered. Wow. Um, which was just insane. The uh, bargain. So with the lack of with the lack of efficiency, but I mean, I sent you that third charge and I put it on X2. Um, but the the actual efficiency that I got out of that last charge, uh, Jesse took a photo of it, but it was literally, um, it was literally. I think I paid three dollars and something like forty cents for 60 kilowatts of energy. It was 57. Here it is. 57 kilowatts delivered at $3 and 44 cents. So that's the full size. Like that's the average full charge for what would be like a Tesla or something like that. And I spent $3 and 40 cents. For and what were you getting? Where were you in where your, your kilowatts on the, the EV go flying J versus the electrify the American EV go DC? flying J. I mean, it, it was a 350 KW uh, yep. pilot charger. So that one delivered 175 like you okay. would see. Cool. But charging curve wise, it was the 175 like you'd see. When you get to about 60%, it cuts down to like the 150 range. Um, and then it goes to like the 130s and the 70s. And then it dips way down at 80. Yep. When I went to the Electrify America the other three times, I had the yeah. exact same charging experience. Okay. Which is this... usually rare. I'm not seeing that same curve, but every single charge, it was 170 until 60, like 170 to 180 till 60. And then it dropped down to the 150s until 70. And then it was in the 130s until I got to 80, which for my truck, that's what's to be expected. So, I mean, the, yep. the stations delivered what they were supposed to, but I will not go back to the pilot EV uh, go station when it's literally eight times more expensive than what um well then what the the cost would be for electrify america three miles down the road and obviously the pilot had a denny's and the cinnabon inside and the rest the restrooms and everything but i'd rather uh, stop at a gas station use the restroom and go save fifty dollars on charging uh than yeah. to do anything else but that's i mean that was just my experience which was crazy but yeah 
But it sounds like you plugged in and the EAs worked just fine and they did all they performed as they yeah, should. I I'm mean, assuming they were I've those, used those, were those same chargers and not had consistent experiences, but mm-hmm. yesterday was completely flawless. It's awesome. Had perfect delivery out of all three different stops that we stopped at. Um all three were good pricing, like beyond what I can imagine. Like our in TVA zone, I'll try to wrap it up, but in the TVA zone, the electric providers somebody had mentioned this on x like you you're as a non-utility provider you can't charge uh for power yes you can um but the rate that the tva charges an electric station charging provider like myself is 22 cents a kilowatt so yeah. you have to so how are they selling a, it you have how to mark they... up above 22 cents in order to make any money yesterday my last stop electrify america i paid like four cents a kilowatt yeah how are and they doing so, that any ideas one you can get discounted power less than mm-hmm. 22 cents if you pay the demand charge. So you can have it. My immediate thought is you can pay the demand charge of $9,000 for a 600 KW de- like delivery system. It's like $9,000 a month, 8,000, something like that. And then your power is bought for nine cents for the first like 300,000 kilowatts used. And then it's four and a half cents for the rest, depending on the power company, roughly that. They are in Walmart parking lots, so they yeah. are probably using the demand of Walmart. If I was to guess, the demand of Walmart, so they the Walmart pays the demand charge uh, for the the mass use of electricity out of their facility and all of the original power costs. So maybe they're acquiring all their power for four and a half cents. For an- Interesting. To consumer, four cents a kilowatt. That doesn't make any sense. So. I, I don't know whether it's a subsidy or a mistake. I mean, the, the efficiency I got there, the other stops were averaging like nine cents a kilowatt, which is still crazy. Still great. Um, but that's still, that's still one of those things that was just insane. So yeah, that's just a little soapbox. Electrify America did great yesterday. Not always, yeah. the case, but it's the older units, not a, no amenities nearby. It is what it is, but I will happily take $15 to get, all the way to Nashville and back with what would have been $120 of fuel at a gas station to do the same thing. Uh, I spent $15 and got there and back, but you know, that the, uh, the, uh, the pilot system, which is going across, I checked multiple pilot stations, which now have chargers near me and all of them are that expensive. If I saw one that even commented that was five cents more. So that system, which they're getting a lot of these Nevi awarded funds, that yeah. system can end up being a deterrent to the EV market because 60 cents a kilowatt. I mean, maybe in California that's competitive with electric prices, but out in Tennessee, 60 cents is going to be far more than the $3 a gallon in gas uh, that gas is currently. And so unless you really just have uh, itch, you have to be under 45 cents really to make it make economical sense. But 50 cents is about the break even with gas from what we've estimated. So I just, uh, it seems like that needs to come down, whether that's the agreement with TVA to bring those costs down um, or something else, because that's obviously not super sustainable moving forward. Yeah. And I think in, in California, you're right. It's different because I'll see anywhere from 45 cents a kilowatt to up to 60. And that's in whether it's EA or Tesla. Now, of course, both of those offer plans where you can get discounts. You know, I when I was at a recent Magic Dock station, it was a 50 cent per kilowatt charge. But if I was on their plan, it would have been forty cents. Um, I should have done the, the plan. plan set up. The plan set up kind of makes sense. I mean, because it gives sure. you the residuals sure. as a company, so you'll all, all, over time make more money. But without the plan, like EV Go and just to plug in and get charged fifty is crazy or sixty is crazy. But yeah, keep going. Yeah, EEA has one as well that I frankly should have done before my trip because I did charge enough. Um, I, I did four charging stops, so I should have. I should have done that. They would have paid itself back if I would have, and I just didn't think about it until somebody commented on X, and I was like, ah, oh, that 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 is something I could have used two days ago. Um, so I didn't, and I paid the normal pricing. And um, and out out here in California, and I've had some a lot of feedback where people just like you have been like, look, I plug in, it works great. I'm assuming those were 350 kilowatt stations that you plugged into all of them were yeah the last the last stop one of the stops all the 350s were full so i used a 150 and they just delivered yeah. 148 until Which it is... dropped to the 130 yeah so. that's great i've never seen a 140 out of a out of a 150 ever uh, yeah. I'm not, i don't even think i promised so. 
Yeah, and, and I don't know if it's because because I've heard a lot of like what you said uh, from people on X that are like I I use EA all the time and it's been great. Um, Maki Vlog they travel a ton and they use the network consistently and so I'm just I'm cursed when it comes to EA and everybody's got kind of horror stories one way or the other. But I have quite literally keeping in mind that I my total DC charging numbers are like you know, 15 events or less, you know, in, in almost two years of ownership. So I am, I am not by any I stretch. four yesterday. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah. I am, I'm, you know, if this is a very unscientific small sample size, but I have literally never ever plugged into an EA station and had it work the very first time without a problem. It's either been yeah. broken, not communicated, derated. Um, I've seen it derate as low as 33 kilowatts, um, but it is it is typical to perform in the 80 to 90 kilowatt when I'm in a 150. So I look for the 350s because um, I do get the best performance out of them. But, uh, you know, on this trip, I, I plugged into one and it had a communication error with a red flashing light on, on the lightning. And then I moved to a, a different one, which was giving me, you know, like 87 kilowatts. I mean, a very typical experience. Um, yeah. And I, I went to on the way back at um, at the Santa Clarita. Uh, I stopped on the other side, on the LA side of the Grapevine, to make it back over the top for Harris Ranch. And when I plugged into that one, it's communication error, and it thought my name was Juan, and it thought that I was in an EV6. And I was like, "All right, well, I'm gonna unplug from this one." And I and I went back down to a different 150, and I got that same kind of, you know, 88 kilowatts out of it, that kind of range, and then. As I went into Walmart to kind of just get some refreshments and stuff, and on my way out, I see this poor guy in a Polestar 2, and he's got his family, and he's plugged in to one, and it was giving him a communications error, and it locked the charge handle in the port, and he couldn't get it to disconnect and disengage. And he, we're on Google. Like, I felt bad he's got his two kids, his wife there. I'm like, I'm not going to leave this poor guy. And so I'm there Google searching. We're looking through every tip and trick. There's like a hold the hazard light button in the Polestar down for like 28 seconds, and it does a restart. There's another kind of reboot to do the infotainment system. Tried turning the car off and letting it sit for like 10 minutes and kind of see if it would disengage. Um, tried calling Polestar. They were of no help at all. Tried calling EA. They were going to send somebody out. They recommended towing like, oh, you know, you can get it towed. And I'm like, how are you going to tow? I'm latched. I'm latched to a level level three charger. What you know, what's the plan there? The, yeah. So finally, after repeated attempts of EA to reset and do some stuff, it finally unlatched. And it uh, but it took a good hour. Um, And I was like, I was fully Protect prepared. Issues, to, yeah. 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 And I was like, I was going to, you know, I was going to help these guys get to, to where they needed to get at least because this was, you know, 10 o'clock at night in the middle of a Walmart parking lot. And I just felt bad yeah. for him. Um, and then, you know, I finally made it up to Harris ranch and um, it was funny because I stopped at Harris ranch on the way down. And that's where I had the communication error with the 350 and had to move. So this time I'm like, well, I'm not going to try that 350 because that's the one I tried just a day ago and it didn't work. I'm going to try the one next to it. I tried the one next to it. And again, it's it's derated, and it was giving me uh, like 60 kilowatts of power from it. And I'd love uh, I messaged Brandon Flash because uh, I'd love to get information on how this works. I don't understand what's going wrong when it derates, um, but again, you know, I'm at 60 kilowatts of power, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to sit here and do that. So I unplugged, and just for the fun of it, I tried the one that gave me the communication error on the trip down, and it worked. And it gave me a decent rate of charge. Uh, in fact, it was the highest rate of charge I have personally ever seen from my standard range. And uh, I think the total was 158 kilowatts at some point, um, which is which was great. It was the most I had seen. So um, then a Mach-E pulls up in, next to the, the other 350 that I had just left. And I told them, I said, hey, it, it derated for me. See what it does for you. Sure enough, it gave him the exact same 60 kilowatt charging speed derated so he moved over to a 150 um and it went back up you know where it was supposed to be so i mean for me it's just been every time i plug into an ea it's either stations down handles broken communication errors derated speeds anywhere from 33 kilowatts to 80 kilowatts and, and 80 is not too far off the mark at least but um, yeah, every single time it's one problem or, or the other with them. And, um, and then the pricing you experience is kind of standard for California, uh, at 45 cents to 60 cents. It's pretty normal out here. So, 
Uh, that was my EA adventure. Not not great. Definitely rather go um, with the Tesla experience for sure. Just from a reliability yeah, standpoint. Yeah, and I mean that's something that obviously we have to see an improvement in the upcoming uh, infrastructure, but something that hopefully with some of the other providers it'll provide a decent realm of competition. So, your camera dropped out, by the way. It did. Yeah. I have to, uh, I'm all late to getting to the, my next appointment. So we're going to end this one here. And, uh, <laughs> Wrap it up. Yep. <laughs> yep. We will come on, to the, on next. the next one. Yep. Well, uh, it's great conversation great as always. Yep. And we will rally up and have a conversation next week. Yeah. Great times. Thanks everybody for listening. And always, uh, like I say, drive what you love and thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Have a great one. <laughs>